Today, Daniel and Tula is going to talk about uh, second language learning in the digital world. Um, and without further ado, let's welcome our speakers. All right. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, for being here. We really appreciate the uh, the invitation. Um, you know, thank you to the Call Club for inviting us. We're just really thrilled to be here and to be able to share some of our uh, research with you today. So. Uh, yeah, let's get started. So, right, we'll be talking about uh, second language learning and research in the digital wilds. So, uh, really the goals of the presentation, we want to give kind of a broad overview of the digital wilds, um, but primarily we'll be focusing on uh, digital game-based language learning. Of course, digital wilds can include other domains, so we'll talk a little bit about some of these other domains, but mainly be focusing on DGBLL. Uh, um, we'll, we'll talk about two studies, and the first study um, is a meta-analysis that kind of gives a broad overview of how effective games have been uh, from the published li literature on uh, uh, digital game-based language learning. And then we'll talk about a second study where we look at the linguistic environments of digital games, because often the L2 input that games provide are often one of the things that are often uh, uh, praised in the literature. All right, so um, what is the digital wild? So probably one of the most common definitions is this one you see at the top. So it's this informal language learning uh, in digital spaces that are independent of instructional context. So meaning it's something you do kind of for fun outside the classroom in some sort of digital domain. Um, and in these domains, L2 learning occurs in highly autonomous, self-directed, and, and creative ways, right? So digital games fits well into this kind of domain. But before getting into uh, digital games, we thought we would talk a little bit about some of the other research outside of gaming, just to kind of give a broader overview. And of course, uh, social media, that's something that, uh, that probably comes to your mind. There's been a lot of research uh, uh, with social media and how this kind of fits into that broader domain of uh, the digital wild. So, for example, in this study, they talked about how uh, participants had these kind of multiple identities and how they use Facebook and they use their second language to navigate these social, cultural, and professional identities on Facebook. Um, another one that is talked a lot about is uh, fan translations, right? So translating like your favorite movie or, or TV shows into an L1 or an L2. And so they say this is really beneficial for language learning uh, because it gives uh, fan translators a lot of agency, like a lot of options uh, capturing the nuances in that language. Because if you do a word for word translation, you probably know it doesn't always capture the um, uh, the essence of you know what they're what they're saying in a particular scene or, or movie, and then this third one I just found the other day, and I thought this was really interesting. I'd never really heard of this before, but I thought I'd bring it up here. Um, a study about bronies, uh, and apparently, yeah, bronies are adult male fans of the animated cartoon uh, My Little Pony, which <laughs> I didn't know was still around. I remember it being popular when I was a little kid, but uh, apparently, yeah, it's still popular. So this study is interesting. So they, they looked at how two groups of bronies, right, um, uh, uh, kind of interacted with each other. I believe one, uh, one group was in uh, Russia and another group was in Spain. And so they did things like fan translation, so similar to the last study, but also doing like fan dubbing. So taking the video and then revoicing it with, uh, you know, in their L2. And so again, it goes back to this idea of the digital wilds being, you know, this uh, autonomous and uh, 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 learning environment. And also, you know, with other fans that were part of these bronies, they got mentoring from people who were maybe more proficient in English. Uh, so it relates to the idea of the zone of proximal development, right, by Vygotsky in 1978. So yeah, I thought I'd just mention a couple of these other studies, but mainly, yeah, now we'll fa uh, focus on digital games and second language acquisition. And this is a screenshot from Skyrim, a really popular game. But you may be thinking, okay, well, why study games, or maybe the call club, you, you feel pretty good about it. Um, but yeah, what kind of got me into this research domain was when I was first doing my MA about 10 years ago at University of Utah, I was playing this game called Skyrim. Uh, also, at the time, I was taking a Portuguese class 
And I felt kind of guilty, like taking time out for myself to play these games, right? And then I noticed, I was like, oh, huh, I can change the language settings to Portuguese. I wonder if that would be helpful for you know, learning the language and kind of getting that extra input. And so I switched it, and I was like, wow, this is actually really helpful. I wonder if anybody in, in, in kind of linguistics has looked into this in more detail. And I was really thrilled to find out that it is this really burgeoning uh, field within computer-assisted language learning. And so from there, I just kind of, yeah, kept kept uh, um, uh, you know, reading about it, doing, doing more research in this kind of domain. Um, also, culturally, games have become really important globally. I mean, we see year after year, uh, digital games get more and more popular. So in 2021 alone, an estimated $180 billion worldwide spent. And that's just such a large number, right? It's hard to grasp like, what that is. So let's compare that to the film industry in which there was an estimated 36 billion. So uh, spending on games has far surpassed uh, spending on Hollywood. So um, you know they're just becoming more popular. Um, when it comes specifically to second language learning in digital games, often researchers talk about this, again, informal digital setting, right, where this incidental learning can take place. And they talk about games being really useful because of their contextually rich virtual world, right? You get this meaningful and engaging uh, input, uh, sometimes producing output if you're playing a multiplayer game, right? Uh, repeated exposures to linguistic, linguistic forms, um, as Ellis writes about, can create these really uh, important form meaning connections in the mind from these repeated exposures, right? And so games are good at repeated exposures because a lot of times they're designed to have you fail, right? So you play a part over and over and over again, and so you're kind of, you know, seeing this, uh, seeing the language in context, and uh, yeah, uh, repeat uh, many times over and over. So we're going to start with the first study. Um, Tulai is going to talk about the extent to which uh, games have been effective for language learning based on. Uh, uh, articles in the published research. So, to what? All right. Thank you, Daniel. Sure. Okay, so am I in the. Yes, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure people on Zoom could see me. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so we wanted to start with this meta analysis just to kind of give you an overview of what we know so far about DGBLL. And I hope that, you know, this will give us all a roadmap for what kind of future studies are needed in the DGBLL research domain. But before I begin, just quickly, if you're not familiar with meta-analyses, it's a research technique that allows you to aggregate effects across studies in the literature. So in this case, we were aggregating effects of digital gaming on L2 learning. So really, we had two goals uh, with this meta-analysis. The first is, determining the overall effectiveness of digital gaming on second language gains, and then examining the factors that make DGBLL less or more effective. And we're going to refer to these factors as moderator variables. So to figure out which moderator variables to look at in our meta-analysis, we had to turn to the literature right, to see what kinds of issues have been raised in previous DGBLL research. So the first uh, moderator variable that we looked at was the purpose of the game. So was it originally developed for educational or uh, entertainment purposes? We really wanted to look at this because unfortunately the Cole community has not given a positive evaluation of educational games and that is because as John Reinhardt from U of A says, Educational games tend to replace play with repetitive and superficial tasks in which the learning objectives are just too obvious, and that makes educational games you know, less engaging. And also, you know, educational games have lower budgets, which tend to you know, uh, get reflected in the quality of the final product. So the second moderator variable that we wanted to look at is player interaction. So that is whether the game used is a single player game played by a single person, right? A multiplayer game played by a small group of people or MMOs which are massively multiplayer online games that are played by thousands of people around the world at the same 
time. And we wanted to look at this because, again, in the literature, it's been hypothesized that the potential for language learning could be greater as in-game social interaction grows larger. So we wanted to see whether that was the case across studies in the literature, at least in the available literature. All right, so the third one that we wanted to look at was uh, teacher mediation. So that simply means that the teacher provided some sort of supplementary material for learners to engage with before, during, or after the gameplay so that learners can get the most out of playing that um, game. Um, so yeah, Jim Rinaldi has an article in which he argues that you know, the learning gains will be greater if there is teacher mediation. So this makes perfect sense, right, to those of us who have teaching backgrounds. Uh, but still, we wanted to see if our intuitions could be backed up by empirical um, data. And the last moderator variable that we'll talk about today is game input and player output. So we know from SLA research that the type and amount of input and output has consequences for second language acquisition, right? And also in the DGBLL research, we also started talking about this. Uh, Hannibal Jensen has an article, and in this article she reports that gaming with both oral and written English input and gaming with only written English input are significantly related to vocabulary scores. But then she also calls for future research examining the kinds of input and output opportunities that are uh, given to the players, the learners. So yeah, because of that, we also wanted to look at the effect of uh, input and output opportunities on L2 gains. So yeah, just to summarize, uh, our research questions for this meta-analysis was, to what extent does digital gaming affect L2 learning outcomes? And to what extent does the effectiveness of digital gaming vary as a function of the intended purpose of the game, player interaction within the game, and whether there is some sort of teacher mediation, and the types of input and output opportunities within the game. So for that, you know, we have to find studies, right, that we could include in our meta-analysis. So in the literature, we targeted studies that had a pre-test, post-test design, and these studies could have either a within-group or between-groups designs. And what does that mean? With the within group designs, there's a group of learners who uh, play a game, right? And they get tested before and after playing the game just to see how much they improve their language skills. And then in within group designs, again, we have a group of learners who play a game, but then this time they're compared against another group who do not play the game but engage in other learning activities. And then the difference between the two groups at the post-test tells us which group made, uh, you know, uh, which group made more progress in their language skills. So to find such studies, we had to search databases, which are all listed here, and then that gave us 98 studies uh, from the literature. But uh, we didn't include all of these studies because we had very specific inclusion an exclusion criteria. Um, I don't have time to go through all of these, but oftentimes we excluded studies because they did not explicitly identify the game that was used in the study. That was important for us to know. <laughs> they measured learning perceptions rather than language proficiency gains, or did not report descriptive statistics that we needed to calculate effect sizes, so the end size, means, and standard deviations. And that left us with 26 studies from the 98 down to 26 with 45 samples. So samples, you can think of them as the dependent variables in the studies, right? In a single study, we can measure both listening skills, for example, and speaking skills. And that would give us two samples from the same study. And now that we're talking about you know, dependent variables, I think this is also a good time to mention that a lot of these 26 studies measured vocabulary development. So in the results, when I say language gains, keep that in mind for the interpretation of the results. 
not all, but most measured vocabulary, yeah. So yeah, once we had all the articles that fit our inclusion criteria, we coded each article for the design elements of the game that was used in the study, the design of the study, and of course the results from the study. And we used the coding scheme that looked like this. This is just a tiny portion of the coding scheme. And then each row in this Excel file represents a sample from a single study. And we had high inner rate of reliability, and also on top of that, we discussed all the discrepancies we had in our coding before moving on to the data analysis. Okay, so when I present the results, I'm going to be talking about effect sizes. So what are effect sizes? They are statistical measurements that tell us the magnitude of the difference between groups. So is it a small difference? Is it a medium difference? A large difference? What is it, right? So again, uh, for within group designs, we calculated effect sizes for the difference between the pretest and the post-test for a group of learners who played a game. And for between group designs, we calculated effect sizes uh, between groups at the post-test, right? But from the gaming group, we also got some within group data, again, by calculating the difference between the pretests and the post-tests. And how did we interpret these effect sizes? So we use these benchmarks that are specific to L2 research domain. And as you can see, the interpretations are different, right, for within group designs and between groups designs. And why is that? because within group designs tend to produce larger effects because as a result of instruction, you expect that learners will learn something, right? Uh, so that is why within group designs produce larger effects and that's why you see different interpretations. And because of this, when I present results, I will separate them by the design of the study. So it, within group versus between groups. Okay, the fun part, results, right? Let's get to the results. Um, so yeah, let's begin with the big question, right? Overall, how effective is digital game-based language learning? So for between groups designs, you see that the effect size is 0 0.65. So what does that mean? The gaming group did better than the non-gaming group, and the difference between the groups is a medium effect size, okay? And then for within group, we have the effect size of 1.18. And what does that mean? The um, gaming group improved their language skills from pre-test to post-test. And that difference between the two tests is medium. And to summarize that, then we can say, yeah, there's a medium positive effect of digital gaming on L2 games, which is really, really encouraging. Okay, so moving on to moderator analyses. So we had some results that had clear interpretations and some not so much. So we're gonna begin with the clear ones and then move on to those that were not so clear. So the question here was, are entertainment games better than educational games for language learning purposes? And as you can see here, for both between groups and within group designs, entertainment games have uh, larger effect sizes, right? And we think that that is because entertainment games are just a bit more engaging and authentic. So another one where we had clear interpretations is teacher mediation. So again, clear results, right? For studies in which there was some uh, teacher mediation, we saw much larger effect sizes for both between groups and within group design. So teacher mediation is well worth the effort, right, in DGBLL context. And then looking at game input. So for game input, we didn't have any studies that use a game that uh, provided learners with only spoken input. So it was either written or written and spoken input. But here, we didn't see any differences between uh, games that provided only written and games that provided both written and spoken input. 
So we were kind of surprised by this, and I'm not going to talk much about this because Daniel is going to tell you all about the input in games and how they vary uh, depending on the various game designs that we have within games. So I'm going to let Daniel talk more about that in the second study. So moving on to moderator analyses with less clear interpretations, uh, we'll begin with player interaction. So single player game, multiplayer game, and MMOs. So the problem we had here was for between groups designs, we didn't have enough studies that used a game that was an MMO. And then for within group designs, we didn't have enough studies that used a game that was a multiplayer game. But just looking at the results we have, we're seeing mixed results here, right? So for between groups, the single player games are less effective. But then when you look at within group designs, we see single player games doing better. So we really can't say if the you know, uh, language learning potential of games increases as the in-game social interaction increases. We really need more research on this. So if anybody wants to take that up, please. Uh, we need more studies looking at this kind of contrast. Um, and then player output, again, we have some mixed results here. If you look at between groups, we see that games that required only uh, spoken output did the best. But then when we look at within group designs, we see that games that required no player output did the best. Again, really mixed results. And another problem, probably you noticed it, is the sample sizes, right? So it's very low, four, four, four here. So perhaps this area is not mature enough to be meta-analyzed, which means that, again, for this contrast to we need more primary studies before it can be meta-analyzed. All right, so just a couple of take-home messages. L2 learners can generally expect medium positive effects on learning outcomes in DGBLL context, which is good news. It's encouraging news. And we also saw much better learning outcomes when there was some sort of teacher mediation. And also, our findings somewhat support that, you know, the hypothesis that entertainment games are perhaps better for language learning than educational games are. And again, that's probably because they're more authentic and engaging. But we put a little star here near somewhat, and that's because although the effect sizes were larger for um, entertainment games, the confidence intervals were wider. So confidence intervals are a statistical measure that shows the amount of error around our measures, right? So unfortunately, there's error in everything we measure. And we had more error for entertainment games than educational games. So again, although there's initial support for this hypothesis, we could, again, use more research in this area. And looking ahead, we need more studies that measure language skills other than vocabulary development. Um, you know, listening skills, speaking skills, pronunciation, uh, that's really lacking in DGBLL um, research. But a really exciting avenue for DGBLL research is investigating how these various game designs can uh, influence L2 learning games. So if you have ever played games, you know, you know that not all games are equal. And what you can do or cannot do in a game and what kinds of language like you're exposed to in the game will have consequences for the language learning potential of that game, right? And Daniel is going to talk more about that, how various game designs require uh, varying degrees of language use and why that matters for DGBLL uh, research. And I think with that, I'll turn the time over to Daniel. All right, thanks, Tulai. All right, great. And that, uh, the last study that we just talked about, uh, meta-analysis, you can download the article from Language Learning and Technology. It was published uh, back in February, so you, it should be pretty easy to find if you, if you want to read more about that. Um, so this study, yeah, the linguistic environments of digital games, and this is in, a, in advanced access in a Calico journal right now. Um, 
So right, all of this is really great uh, based on the meta-analysis. We see that digital games can be really effective for, for language learning, right? Um, but researchers have begun to raise um, some, some concerns and some issues with the generalizability of gaming on L2 learning. So if you play games, right, you probably know that there's lots of different types of games, lots of genres and things like that. So in the literature, researchers tend to generalize gaming effectiveness um, to a specific title. And by far, World of Warcraft has received probably the most attention uh, in the literature. Or um, oftentimes, we'll, we'll, they'll generalize about a specific genre, like massively multiplayer online games. Um, so, um, you know, in, in a lot of this research, they talk about, okay, at times, or participants, there's a really high uh, level of language interaction. They're using the language, they're talking to each other, uh, they're reading things on the screen, but other times, there's very little language use, right? Um, so, I saw this great talk, actually, at AZ, at AZ Call in 2019 that really inspired a lot of the research that I do now, when you had uh, uh, John come and talk. And he talked about um, you know, generalizing the implications uh, from the study of L2 gameplay with one title to other titles can be risky, right? So a better approach is to think about how the games are designed and look at these individual kind of game mechanics, which are more universal, um, that you can then compare across games. Um, so right, if you play games a lot, uh, you know that sometimes you're, you, you're reading language, other times you're hearing spoken language. It really depends on what you're doing in the game, right? Whether you're reading, whether you're listening, how you're using the language, for what purpose, what context. So I was thinking, oh, you know, it'd be really interesting to uh, see how these different designs, these different game mechanics um, use language differently and for what purposes, right? Because you may pay attention to certain aspects of the game more than others um, and that sort of thing. So my goals for this particular study was to identify how language is used in various game mechanics in a targeted population of games and look at, okay, what are the pervasive and meaningful linguistic features for each of these different contexts um, and uh, yeah, just, so basically looking at how linguistically these, these game designs and game mechanics are different and how those may, be, uh, may benefit L2 learning. Now, I didn't measure any actual L2 learning gains in this study, um, but I thought it would be a good starting place just to get an idea of how different mechanics have uh, different language use. So what I do in this study is you may have heard uh, of the register analysis approach, what we, which we use at NAU quite often uh, from uh, Biber and Conrad 2019. So they describe a register simply as a situation of language use. So um, linguistic features tend to occur frequently in one register over another register because they're particularly uh, well suited for the communicative purpose of that particular situation. So kind of to give an example here, um, here we're talking face-to-face -face conversations and so research shows that demonstrative pronouns, for example, are used quite often because we, can, we, we have the shared time and space. I can say this, that, those, right, and you know what I'm talking about, right? Whereas in written, line, uh, written registers, you can't really do that. You have to be more specific, so it's much more informational, informa informational a lot more uh, information packing, lots of nouns, and that sort of thing. So uh, put simply, I guess uh, an overview of register analysis would be first you identify registers, right, different situations of language use, looking at their situational characteristics, you know, communicative purpose, among other aspects, and then compiling a representative corpus of text for each of those registers, conducting quantitative analysis, um, linguistic comparisons across registers to see how they're uh, linguistically unique, and then interpreting those uh, quantitative uh, data qualitatively based on those situational characteristics that you identified in that first step. So. Um, this is uh, an earlier form of the corpus I've been compiling over the past couple of years. It's kind of hard to read. Let me see if I can actually move that. I'm not sure that I can, though. If I click there, nope. OK, that's all right. Um, right, which I call the single player offline corpus, because it's, um, it's, uh, it's all the games that are included are single player games, like Fallout and Skyrim. So these were the two games that I had compiled in the corpus at the time. I've added two more to it since then. Um, 
So right, the first step, looking at uh, identifying the different game registers. So I found, for this one, three, which I call uh, dialogue trees, quest objectives, and quest stages. So I'll just give you a kind of a brief example of these registers. So um, this is a screenshot from Fallout 4. And if you played this game, uh, you know there's hundreds of automated characters within the game, right? Um, lots of automated characters around the world. And you, it's got a, a, a really strong focus on telling a story, right? There's a narrative. So this is a particular part in the game when you uh, meet uh, a woman named Piper who's a reporter in this town. And she's having problems with the mayor. So you listen to her speech, and then you're prompted to make a choice, right? Uh, dialogue trees, right? So you can say that you want to help her, you support the news, or you can say that you hate newspapers and like refuse to help her or request more information. So this would be the first register that I identified in this uh, particular population of games, just called dialogue trees. And then there's two written registers, which I call uh, quest objectives. And you see those here. Again, these aren't spoken. You just read them. They're in the menus of the game. And they give kind of just a short uh, task that you need to carry out in order to complete a particular quest or, or, or task, right? Um, and then right above that, you're seeing the third register, which are quest stages. And these give context to these. Um, objectives as they relate to kind of the broader storyline of the game, right? So in this one, I've been captured by the Empire, sentenced to death alongside the Stormcloak rebels. Sounds like a familiar story, right? Um, so they're taken to Helgen, and you have to escape in this dragon attack. So yeah, it gives the kind of the context of why you're doing these particular objectives. So I, I don't have time to go too much into how I compiled the corpus. Um, but basically I use mod software or mod tools to extract the actual language files from the games themselves because I wanted it to be, uh, you know, 100% accurate to what uh, would actually be seen in the game. And actually this is some raw data from, from The Witcher 3, which is a game I added later. Um, but basically here's what a, a process text looks like. And the stuff you're seeing in angle brackets wasn't part of the linguistic analysis. These are the choices that appear on the screen. And because they're not actually spoken, um, I didn't include them in the linguistic analysis. But this metadata that you see here can be important when you're making those qualitative interpretations. So in the end, um, I had about 6,000 texts in the two games across the three different uh, game mechanics or, or registers. So I targeted uh, five different linguistic features for this study, and these are linguistic features that are thought uh, that are that have been shown to be really uh, pervasive in spoken language. So I thought this would be a good starting point to kind of look at how the written registers differ from the spoken registers. Um, so I looked at pronouns, uh, these different semantic categories of verbs, mental and activity verbs. And then I had two lexical complexity measures, uh, richness, which was really just a variety of words used, and then some sophistication, uh, which is the use of advanced words. So I made a list of the, or I wrote a, a Python script that uh, output a list of the 1,500 most common words in the British national corpus. And I said, OK, if, if the word isn't in that list, and it's not also one of these, then we'll call that an advanced word, because it's less common. So I uh, wrote a couple Python scripts to uh, count these features in these texts from the game using really uh, spacey, a really powerful natural language processing tool that you can use within Python um, that's uh, really useful for this type of research. So in the end, this is kind of what the data looked like in the end or, or after I did the counts. So it's um, just the mean of the number of times that that feature appeared in a text divided by the total number of words for each of the 6,000 texts, and then getting a mean for that. And this will make more sense uh, in a minute here. So my, the research questions I wanted to ask were, to what extent can the linguistic features of a text, you know, those five different ones that I looked at, how well can a statistical model predict which game uh, the text came from? And then I had a separate model look at, OK, which mechanic, uh, ignoring the game, but looking at, OK, which mechanic 
the text come from? And then a third one is saying, okay, when it has to decide both game and mechanic at the same time, let's see how well it does. And I was thinking that probably the second one would do best, because going back to what John Reinhardt talks about, right, that when we look at these different mechanics, um, you know, we should really be focused on those rather than taking the game as a whole approach. So my kind of working hypothesis was that the second one would do the best. So just to give a brief overview of discriminant analysis, um, so the, the, the purpose is to predict group membership based on a set of observations, or, or of a set of observations based on variables. So in this case, I'm predicting register categories, so the, or, or the game mechanic, of those texts in the corpus based on their frequencies of linguistic features. So you're probably thinking, but wait, didn't you know ahead of time what category they belong to? And I, and I did. So the point of uh, uh, discriminant analysis isn't to deter, uh, determine where something belongs, but rather to determine the extent to which those uh, linguistic features can predict the correct category in the data. Right, so it uh, kind of takes the, the, the frequency data and uh, reduces them to a smaller set of functions. And I use two different functions here, uh, which are really just linear combinations of the variables to use for the prediction. So here's kind of that frequency data. So what happens here is it builds this model based on uh, this different frequency data. So what you're seeing here is each one of these little dots represents one of the texts in the corpus. And those bigger dots are the mean centroids, are called. So the mean of where all those texts lie. So you're seeing the, that this kind of big one here, there was by far more spoken dialogue text than there were written ones. Um, so yeah, that's what you're seeing here with each of the different colors, different games, different registers. And I uh, used R for the, for the data visualizations there. So basically what's going on here is, so I feed it like a text into this model, and the model goes, hmm, I think that's a dialogue tree based on the information I have. Or feed in a, a quest objective or a quest stage, and it goes, oh, I think that's a quest objective. So in the end, you're seeing how well it did with these different predictions. So let's take a look. We'll take a look at the third one first here. And so the output that you get from a discriminant analysis is called a confusion matrix. And it's not because it's confusing to read, but it's how often the model itself got confused with its prediction. So let's, we won't go through this uh, in too much detail, but here if we look at this first column here, this is the fallout dialogue text. All right, so there was 3,700 texts that actually were from Fallout that belonged to this particular register, right, dialogue tree. So it correctly predicted 3,600 out of 3,700. That seems pretty good, but um, that's called the recall rate. But if we look at precision, it also predicted 2,000 of Skyrim's dialogue to also belong to Fallout. So actually, it's really not that great, about 63% precision. So when the model has to predict both game and mechanic at the same time, we can see it doesn't do great, right? I mean, uh, uh, just 7% for Fallout Quest stages. So not great when it has to do both of these things. So let's look at how well does the model do when it only has to predict which game it belongs to. So here, we see it doesn't do well at all. It predicted all of the text belonging to Fallout and couldn't see any differences between uh, the two games' linguistic features, right? So that kind of, again, ties back to what, to, to what John Reinhardt was saying about um, looking at mechanics rather than games as a whole, because as a whole, they seem quite linguistically similar, um, and the model couldn't predict them, at least based on these particular linguistic features. So let's say, OK, take out the game. Let's tell the model just it only has to identify which game mechanic it came from. And here is actually where the model does better than any of the others, right? We can see the dialogue trees. It got 98% recall, 98% precision, 98 here, 90 here. It didn't do great with quest stages, but it was still much better than it did in any of the uh, previous models, right? So, and this makes a lot of sense, actually. So if we go back and we look at this, uh, you know, uh, this plot here, we can see that the mechanic categories kind of are pretty close to each other across the two games. So we have both games quest stages, quest objectives, dialogue trees. So if we get rid of the game and just focus on the mechanics, we can see these kind of clear, distinct uh, linguistic environments arise from uh, the features that these different mechanics use. 
All right, so uh, what does all this mean? Yeah, so the main point is, yeah, taking this game as a whole or genre approach to L2 gaming research uh, can be problematic. So taking it as a whole, these games appear to be quite linguistically similar. But in contrast, when we look at the mechanics, we can see, oh, these distinct linguistic environments, uh, again, arise from the data. So really, uh, it gives support to looking at this design-informed approach to research where you're looking at game mechanics and less so on titles or genres so we can make more precise generalizations. I think we're running a little short on time, so maybe I'll skip, uh, I, won't, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, some of the linguistic differences among these registers, um, for example, quest uh, objectives here, really simple language, right? Really clear, unambiguous direction to the player, right? Because if you didn't know what to do in a game, it probably wouldn't be very fun. So they want to make sure that you know what you're trying to do, what your target is, and that sort of thing. So it's actually uh, let, uh, the least sophisticated uh, word. So you might say for early language learners, this type of mechanic might be beneficial because it doesn't use really complex uh, language. Uh, there's not many pronouns either. Um, then moving on to the quest stages, this was a little more complex than the quest objectives, but we see a lot of pronouns because it's often written from the first person perspective of the main character in the game. It's like a journal almost, and they tend to repeat words more often. So going back to uh, what Alice writes about um, um, you know, repeated exposures to linguistic forms, this could be good for, um, yeah, for tying that into it and seeing those linguistic forms a number of times uh, and getting those repeated exposures. And of course, you know, not surprising, dialogue uh, turned out to be the most complex use of language, so this could be a really difficult mechanic um, or, or design for early learners. You know, it had the highest a uh, number of sophisticated words, lots more pronouns, and uh, didn't repeat words as often. So let me just skip ahead here. So yeah, main point I'm making again just to reiterate is that we can better generalize by targeting these different mechanics rather than generalizing at the level of a uh, game title or, or a certain genre uh, of games. Um, yeah, so thank you all. I really appreciate yeah, being here today, and thank you all so much. Tuai and I can uh, answer any questions, and we're happy to hear any comments uh, that you may have. And if there are questions in the Zoom, uh, if you could let us know that oh, yeah. too, we would appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, to facilitate this. Um, okay, so we are uh, going to address questions from this room first, and then we will go to the online folks. Um, so for our uh, Zoom participants, if you have a question now, please um, enter it in the chat. Or um, I, I, get, I guess they can just speak, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. as yeah. long as we if can you, hear them, whatever works. If you prefer to yeah. have, uh, if you prefer to just... Oh, actually. I have muted it because then we would hear oh, ourselves, I think, from the feedback. Yeah. Yeah, then in that <laughs> case, the Maybe. written communication is probably the best. Mm -hmm. um, is there any questions from this room? Thank you so much for, for coming here. And, and as, as you and, and some, some of the, the audience know, that I also do um, research on games and, and learning. So I have a lot of questions, but I'll start with the first one. Okay. <laughs> um, since we just talked about study two, um, and I know that the, the particular kind of game that you looked at are a multiplayer game, and especially if you ma massive, uh, massively online MMO. Um, RPG. From study two. From study two. So study two was single player games. Uh -huh. yeah, yes, single Spock player. stands for single player offline. Corpus. But yeah, in the, in the meta we did look at yeah. MMOs and stuff. But yeah, for the Corpus, um, yeah, it was mainly single. It was only single player games because mm -hmm. those have received kind of less attention in the literature. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of look right. at that. And, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so my question is, would you would you feel like that? type of analysis would be also um, available to use for other type of games? Definitely. Um, multiplayer or other like sim more simplified games? 
Sure, yeah, and the, the great thing about the register analysis, analysis approach that Byron and Conrad talk about is really it can be used on any language variety. So it could be, yeah, I, I think it would be great. In fact, that's something I'd like to see in future research is um, looking at different populations of games because really I looked at a very, very specific population, right? These open world kind of uh, narrative, story heavy kind of games because they use language just so much. But it'd be really interesting, yeah, to target other populations of games so we can understand, yeah, how those mechanics use language for what purposes and kind of compare across studies. So yeah, I think it would work really well on, on a different target population as well. Yes. So for the first study, uh, I have a question here. So you have a pretest and post test, and mm -hmm. from my understanding, you have a control and treatment groups. So my question: Did you uh, test their proficiency level before doing that study? Mm. Yeah. So with the meta analysis, actually, we we did not run those studies. We looked at the studies that were in the literature, and. So it is up to the researchers whether they controlled for the proficiency differences at the outset, right? But we didn't want to go down that rabbit hole because then we were starting to question study quality and that's just a whole other world and we decided that we will be inclusive as much as we can and include all the studies that fit our you know, inclusion criteria, but yet to reiterate we did not run those studies. They were primary studies in the literature. And we used the results from those to aggregate effects of you know, digital gaming on L2 gains. But we did. They did have to have a pretest and post-test. Yeah. Wasn't that one, uh, of our, yeah. So yeah. one of our inclusion criteria was that, yeah, they did do a pretest and a post-test. Um, and yeah, we didn't use studies that did not, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, in another meta-analysis we did, we actually looked at that, making sure that you know, the learners were at the same level before they started the treatment. And we didn't end up actually excluding a lot of studies, so we didn't think it was problematic to be inclusive and include in all studies that had a pretest and a post-test, because the reason that they were doing a pretest is to, you know, uh, make sure that the two groups are equal. And especially if they're randomly assigned to groups, then that is not problematic at all, right? Because the random assignment to groups kind of takes care of that uh, problem you have, yeah, with the differences. Thank you so much. Yes. I have a question. I, um, I am uh, somewhat allergic to video games. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> just to put it out there to, to begin being super honest. Um, but one thing that I'm really interested in, in, in terms of language learning in the digital wilds, is the effect of the variety of, in this case, English, mm -hmm. that is presented or embedded in each video mm -hmm. game. So what is your take on the um, accuracy of the register model when it comes to games with different vari varieties of, so for instance, English embedded? Mm -hmm. Do you think um, that the results will be similar or um, the variety chosen for that particular game would kind of affect not only uh, the results of the model, but also the, the, the intake of the, the language itself mm -hmm. in the player. Mm -hmm. you want me to mm -hmm. Yeah, I think depending on what uh, target population of games that you're, that, that, that you're targeting, yeah, the language is going to be really, really different. Um, so I tried to pick in that particular study linguistic features that um, you know, uh, that were more grammatical, although I did have some lexical ones as well with sophistication and things. But yeah, that's something I'd, I'd really like to see future research address is again, yeah, kind of targeting these different populations and seeing how the language use is, is different. And another, to kind of add to that, it'd be also interesting to switch the game to another language, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and then see uh, how that compares to the English version of, of your game. Was that your question? No, I mean, okay. I, was, I was concerned because you presented an image of The Witcher and I uh -huh. think the type of language uh, used is, is, is very particular. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said before, I'm not familiar with the different video games. Mm -hmm. um, so I have no knowledge on how different the, the 
the written or verbal cues would be in terms of the syntactic structure sure. or even the, the, the vocabulary like you mm -hmm. um, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that was my question, whether okay. um, from your experience sure. um, with, with and if you also know this, this type of games, would it create a, a difference? But yeah. of course, the language is another. Yeah, question. that's a whole because I right. Would like to, as a, I know that the Portuguese and oh, okay. my, my native language is Spanish. So it would be interesting also to see those. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, so in my in my dissertation, I had four games, so the two there, and then also uh, Witcher and this game called Divinity 2. And because they have such different settings, like Fallout takes place like in the future, other ones are supposed to be like ancient times. So yeah, definitely a lot of uh, lexical differences there, you know, um, kind of old English they use in The Witcher and yeah. stuff. So how transferable is that to the real world? Uh, it's a good question, but that's, that's the next step is to try to get some empirical studies that say, okay, they played with this mechanic in this context, let's see how that transfers. And if they're saying, you know, yeah. Thou shall not pass, or something like that. Maybe that's not super useful, but the grammatical forms are actually pretty pretty consistent across the games in the registers, which is really interesting. Um, I thought, but yeah, that's that's something to explore more for sure. But thanks for the question. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Thank you so much for coming. I really enjoy your presentation a lot. Thank you. So uh, I have a question about, I find one of the assumptions about single player, multiplayer, and MMO, I find it very problematic. Mm. Because even with single player game, with players do not just connect with each other within the game, mm -hmm. but also they do things outside the game, like in different spaces, which is my research area. Okay. So how do you feel about, um, how, how would you treat that part of the linguistic environment into your research? Yeah, I mean, you can't, so I think you're asking that for the meta-analysis, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the one thing about meta-analysis is that it's really good at giving you a broad overview. And that's why we stated that exact language in the goals of the presentation. It kind of shows you general trends, right? Maybe areas where we need more research. But it can't tell you exactly what is happening, right? What learners are exactly doing when they're playing those games. So that's where the primary studies come into play, like your dissertation, right? <laughs> Seeing what learners do, not just in the game, but outside of the game, maybe connecting with other game players on those, you know, what do you call them, forums? Yeah, like I guess. Reddit and stuff like yeah. that, or even, uh -huh. yeah, face to face. But yeah, so with that meta analysis, the only contrast we could do, okay, what kind of a game did they use? But like you said, you can't really see what learners exactly did. So that's the limitation of meta-analysis, yeah. It's good for giving you a broad overview, but it's not good for telling you what exactly transpired, right, mm -hmm. when the learners were playing that game. And that's where qualitative research should kick in. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So I guess my argument is actually what kind of uh, linguistic environment mm -hmm. that a gamer is immersed in actually vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just about the game me mechanics, it's not just about the Definitely. game, but also about uh, where they choose to stay in. Like exactly. some of them join Discord, some of them stay in uh, like subreddit, sure. some of them play the game only, and some of them don't, don't even know the language, they just try to randomly play the game. That's a great point. Yeah, and, and so that's kind of the next step is we, we, we want to kind of get some empirical evidence and kind of look at what people pay attention to when they're playing yes. these games. Like yes. the lore, for example. Like if I'm playing these games, I, I usually ignore it. Like all these yeah, different yeah. kinds of lore things. I'm like, I don't really care that much. Yeah. But some people really do, right? Some people really get into that history in the background. and the lore. Deep, Yeah, yeah, the lore, the, lore, yeah. the game lore, right? Mm -hmm. So it might be important to some people, but maybe not to other people. So that'd be like an eye tracking study or something would, yeah. Be, yeah. would be really exciting uh, mm -hmm. to see. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's very little research about mm -hmm. the actual language in the games and what players actually pay attention to. So if you're yeah, into you know, doing research with digital games, those are really like exciting avenues for all of us to uh, follow, I guess, and explore, yeah. Thanks for your question. Yeah, thank you. Brian? I'm so, um, Tula, I'm so glad that you mentioned the qualitative part, because there's a lot of people in this room probably like, oh my god, meta-analysis. <laughs> not so not my thing. But, um, it's, I mean, you, that's right, you do, certain, you do a certain thing. And yeah. that's, you know, 
you can only take that so far. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge amount of what's going on, like you suggested, mm -hmm. that is um, that could be addressed, I suppose, not being a qualitative researcher, so what do I know? Um, maybe one of you guys has an idea. That could be addressed mm -hmm. um, through qualitative measures. Like in, in the first thing I wrote down when you said, well, we went from 98 studies down to 26, I thought, <laughs> oh my god, is that because they, the rest were qualitative, or was it just sloppy call research? <laughs> so, I mean, which one was it? Because there, as you know, there are a lot of um, calls, yeah. kind of a bad rap for being not as rigorous in terms of SLA and even research methodology, sure. right? Sure. For better or worse. So what, what was it? Were, was some of it just sloppy research? They didn't report what game they're using? <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so this is really unfortunate, but... <laughs> uh, yes. So what is happening is that a lot of the studies did not report these very simple descriptive statistics that we needed, like the end size, means and standard deviations, and right? And some... still got published. <laughs> <laughs> so, or the title sometimes. Yeah, that's you know? why so. we lost a lot of the studies, because we need those to be able to calculate. And then when you contact the researchers, they sometimes don't have access to that data anymore, mm -hmm. or maybe they change their email addresses. It's really difficult to um, track down people and get that information. We tried. So yeah, that didn't work out that well. Uh, so that was one problem. And then the other is that it's not a problem. I mean, it's great research. It's just they, uh, some of the studies were looking at learner perceptions of playing game, right? Like, how did you feel about playing this game? Uh, you know, do you feel like you learned? Uh, which is great research, by the way. Yeah, which we're is not, great research. like, disparaging that. Or but for meta-analysis, it doesn't work because you, you want know, those points. numbers. You're looking at learning gains, and that has to be somehow quantified for meta-analyses mm -hmm. to work. So that, that, those were the two things. But yeah, for those of you who are here and online, we would really encourage everybody to report at a minimum and size, uh, means, and standard deviations so that when the field is mature enough to meta-analyze, people can uh, meta-analyze it. Yeah. yeah. As well as, the, if I could just follow up, sure. as well as things that seem intuitive, to many of us, but we don't always see enough um, detail mm -hmm. in the methodology. Mm -hmm. And right. the idea is that your methodology has to be detailed enough to do what? So Replicate. someone can replicate, Replicate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And very often we don't see that either, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. can I just ask one? Um, sure. So about your moderator variables from that meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. So um, the, you, you mentioned teacher mediation yeah. as one of them. Okay, so my question is, um, can you say a little more about that variable? Was it like a dichotomy, like a, like a binomial? Was it um, like a zero or one? Or was it like, sure. a, like a more of an ordinal scale? Or was it like this type of teacher mediation? Yeah, yeah. so we, we love to do kind of a more nuanced analysis on that part, but it was just used, used it or didn't use it. Okay. And you know, sometimes maybe they did use something, but they didn't mention it, like you said, in the methodology. So we just had to say, OK, we're going to count that as a no, because they didn't mention anything. But yeah, that's a great direction for future research, is the extent that the teacher medi uh, mediated material played a role, mm -hmm. um, especially since we saw that there was such a big difference between those who did and those who did not. So it seems that, media, that extra material is well worth the effort by the teacher. So yeah, I'd love to see if anybody wants to take, uh, take on that study, kind of what kind of material is being used, but, um, and, and to what extent, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's all about the reporting. So <laughs> another thing that we couldn't examine was the amount of time mm -hmm. playing the game. Because again, in the method section, this is reported in different ways. Some people say, OK, five sessions. but how long were those <laughs> sessions, right? So we can't convert those five sessions into minutes or hours. Um, so really, when you're doing meta-analysis, you can only meta-analyze what has been reported in the literature. And that's why it's really important, like in the methods section, to be uh, very transparent about what has been done as part of that study, just giving as much information as possible. And, some of our mentors at Northern Arizona University, they say, if you have to cut something from your paper, cut it from the literature, right? Like, give those words to the method section 
So others that people may have can, opinions, right? uh, yeah, others may have different opinions, but our mentors at Northern Arizona University often highlighted that if something needs to go, not from the method, uh, from the maybe intro, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm oh, sorry, it's more like a curious question, but slightly related to um, study two. Uh, I myself don't play game, but my brother does. Uh -huh. and he considers himself as a Japanese monolingual speaker, but he's quite fluent in like, multiple player like, online uh -huh. communication. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed and very interesting is that like they use lots of like game jargons, Definitely. like GG, like good game. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's like, <laughs> I don't know, that, that, that this is the only one I know, but mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting because like, it kind of has the feature of like world Englishes mm -hmm. and your study about more like input side of those you know mm -hmm. gaming language but if you have any thoughts on like output that how the you know actual like gamers that like, language you use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know that would just that would be an excellent like register analysis to look at the spoke the yeah the output that players produce in games especially with the MMO games. Because I'm sure yeah there's tons of jargon in there. It's almost like its own language sometimes. Uh, but um, yeah, we didn't actually look at that in that particular study. Um, I was just wanting to look at the language input that you're getting from those automated characters. So not from real people, but from all the recorded audio and things like that. But yeah, I'd love to see more research that uh, yeah compiles a big corpus from. Um, and I and actually thought about this a couple years ago because on YouTube and Twitch, people post themselves playing games all the time with other people. So that'd be a really rich uh, source for data to kind of get an idea of what kind of language is used and what context and how perhaps their language changes depending on what they're doing in the game, whether they're fighting a boss or, or collecting, you know, uh, uh, materials for crafting or, or whatever. But yeah, um, I'd love to see more research that looks at that for sure. There's no more. Brian is. Yeah. I do. So are we going to get kicked out of this room? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's 10 after 4. Oh, okay. So we have to walk really slow to get up there. No, we have, no, we have people. Online. Questions and so Oh, okay. Go ahead. Questions oh, okay. Are there online questions? Yes. Okay. Sure, listen to that. Yeah, you can stay first. Stay first. <laughs> yeah, so now we're transitioning to the online questions and Eva um, will help us read out those questions. Um, but if you um, uh, absolutely want to talk, maybe just mute yourself and let's see how it goes. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. And Eva, it's yours. So which camera, no, which microphone should I talk to? Their, their mm. voice oh. coming to their uh, computer. All right, first of all, thank you everyone on Zoom for participating. And uh, as your moderator, I'm going to ask questions on behalf of you. So the first question comes from Michael. And his question is, most, of digi most digital games tend to be focused around themes of fantasy, science fiction, etc., mm -hmm. and do not necessarily appeal to a wide audience. Mm -hmm. If and when digital games are developed for a wider audience, do you think the role of any of the moderator variables or influence of the mechanics would change in a particular direction? That's a great question. You want me to answer that? Yeah. Okay. That's yeah, that's that's a great question, and um, yeah, that kind of goes to to I guess the main point we we were trying to make in that study that right, it's really the type of language that you're exposed to is going to depend, of course, on the setting of the game. Like you mentioned, some to sci-fi, some are like ancient times, um, also the type of design. But yeah, let's say they design games that are more designed to, for a broad, broad audience, probably it would be quite different. And so it'd be really interesting to kind of add what we can learn from that by doing another register analysis, another corpus analysis of these other games to see how they compare to the games that I looked at. I mean, I only looked at two games uh, for this particular study, so it's really hard, it, well, really impossible to make broad generalizations. But I saw it as a good kind of starting place, and hopefully other researchers uh, kind of pick this up and, and look at other targeted games, different game mechanics to see how they compare. So to answer your question, yeah, we just don't know 
yet because not enough research has been done, but it kind of provides some really exciting avenues for future, for future research. Um, and if you're interested in that, yeah, we should talk and, and, and uh, yeah, see some more register analyses of uh, digital games. Hmm. All right. Michael, does that answer your question? <laughs> Hopefully it does. All right, next question comes from Sean. Uh, I wonder if the category of dialogue could be broken up. There are many types of dialogues that exist in video games, and it would be interesting to explore how learners interact with different scenarios as they present themselves in dialogue, such as exchange based on competitive, mm -hmm. etc. Wow, I'm glad you asked that question because actually uh, in my dissertation I did split the spoken language into two kind of broad register categories and one was uh, I call interactive speech and that's kind of what I showed in the presentation where you have to make a choice like the game pauses uh, and doesn't move forward until you make that choice of how to respond and so that's different from what I called immersive speech which are just kind of NPCs in the background talking to one another or, um, you know, uh, you just walk by and you hear a character talking to themselves or the, the actual player character may say something. Yeah. So the main difference there was, yeah, one requires the player to do something, the other one is just kind of immersive, you don't really have to pay attention to it. But you're right, I think we could split it many more ways, even further than that. Like you said, whether it's uh, co involved in combat, what language is used, uh, commerce, buying, selling items, that sort of thing. But, yeah, again, I was, since I, there isn't a ton of research on this yet, I just wanted to start broad and then kind of uh, uh, get more nuanced from there. But yeah, I'm really glad you asked that, and that's a great point. So thank you for, for that. Thank you, Sean, for your question. Oh yeah, it reminds me of the combat dialogue I hear. I, I often hear my enemies, I yelled, I yelled. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so next question comes from uh, Kelly. I'm wondering if game experience might also be a moderator variable. Gamers who are used to the, these mechanics are trained to how games function and might pay less attention to written input, such as quest stages, etc. While new gamers might need to rely on these features more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that would be an excellent moderator, I think, for a future meta analysis. Analysis we thought about. I can't remember if we considered something like that. But again, we didn't really have a lot of that information in the studies we aggregated because they don't often talk about the amount of experience that their participants had. So it was hard for us to to know that information. But yeah, I think that's a great idea, and I'd love to see a study like that. And I would have no doubt that, yeah, prior gaming experience would have an effect on probably what they pay attention to. Um, it can just seem overwhelming, but yeah. I see that difference just between the two of us. I read everything that I come across because I'm like, oh, this must be important, right? Because otherwise, it wouldn't be here. But then you, an experienced gamer, it's like, oh, you don't need to pay attention to all that because then I get so overwhelmed with all that input on the go that this must be important, this must be important, and I can't make much progress in the game because I'm reading everything I see. Uh, so yeah, definitely that is an important moderator variable. <laughs> what you're paying attention to in the game. Yeah. Any other questions, Eva? That's all the questions we have okay. for now. But other people, if you happen to have other questions, we still have time, so you can shoot your question in the chat. And we can come back to and the... Maybe, um, maybe Eva, could you please type the email addresses in the chat? Sure, sure, I will. So I'm going to share um, Daniel and Tule's email in the chat so that people online, you can still... Yeah, and happy to hear uh, you know any, anybody's ideas, thoughts, and uh, yeah, it's always great to hear yeah. uh, from colleagues about what they think. And thank you for attending, yeah. everybody here and on Zoom, and yeah, yeah we question. really appreciate it. Thank you. Another question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll go. I'll go for, uh, so let me understand as a non-gamer, right? Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So when you say game mechanics, I'm with you on that. Would you, do you think we can equate the notion of game mechanics with the call notion of affordances of software and courseware? Are we talking about the same kind of things? Yeah. So things that it can do, things that it's good for, things that it mm -hmm. isn't good for. 
exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very similar. Like, uh, what are you using at the ASU? Canvas, Blackboard? Canvas. canvas? Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> I like canvas. Are yeah. you using Blackboard? Yeah. yeah oh look, look at the intonation. Yeah. Are you using Blackboard? Oh my God. <laughs> uh, what? Yeah. So, what? Blackboard. Yeah. What can you do on Blackboard versus Canvas? The affordances right. of each. That's so similar to the, the same game. Same kind of thing we're talking about. Yeah. Right? Okay. Exactly. So, with the research in gaming right now, are we? Um, are we at the point, or are we at the point in, in research that we can say, all right, let's think about the game mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to elicit a certain kind of language use, mm -hmm. use games with these affordances or yeah. these mechanics. Are we there yeah, yet, exactly. or are we trying to still get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think we're definitely getting a lot closer, especially John's uh, John Reinhardt's work. He does just that. He talks about okay, this mechanic has affordances for this particular type of uh, uh, L two development. Or, um, but yeah, if you look at his twenty twenty one article, I believe it's called "Not All MMOs Are Created Equal." He does just that. He gives a table. But mm -hmm. I think yeah, we just need a lot more research to really understand the extent to which these different affordances slash mechanics will affect uh, different aspects of second language learning. Um, but we're getting there, and yeah, um, but it's something I think this, this kind of idea is uh, still kind of new and, and developing, but um, yeah. So we're on the way to being able to like make it pedagogically, like mm -hmm. pedagogical recommendations. Right. But, because, but we're yeah. still on yeah. the way there. Right, we're not quite there yet, but again, I would yeah strongly recommend uh, Reinhardt's 2019 and 2021. Um, he does talk about that, but um, yeah, it'd be great if we had more empirical studies that kind of um, uh, look at the extent to which yeah they mm -hmm. they do affect L2. Yeah, yeah, I mean yes. those mechanics, as Daniel has shown, are associated with different kinds of linguistic features. For example, if you are trying to let's say measure someone's uh, interactive skills, right, in face-to-face uh, -face communication, then you would, and if you want to test them using a digital game, then you would use a lot of maybe dialogue trees uh, and see how they're, you know, understanding the choices that they're being presented to them and how they're interacting with those choices. Uh, but if you were measuring their understanding of narrative style, narrative writing, right, then in that case, Quest stages. stages would be a more uh, important mechanic than the others. So yeah, first I think, like Daniel said in his article, we first got to really understand like what kinds of language is used in these different game mechanics, so that from there we can start having some more pedagogical uh, implications, like for teaching and assessment and self-study, educational technology, um, educational technology, and all that. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned the um, confidence inter interval spread, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was related to what I'm about to ask, but it might be. So is there, when you look at, uh, is there a lot of variability across games with like mechanics? Mm -hmm. like, is, that, is there a lot of noise there? Yeah. Because what we want to do is be able to say it's predictive. You know, here are these mechanics, easily identifiable, mm -hmm. use them for these purposes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in my dissertation, because I have so many texts for each, each register, the confidence intervals are actually pretty tight. So as far as what linguistic features they use, I mean, there's definitely variation for sure, but with enough data, you can really get a, uh, a, a what am I trying to say? I really... Narrow confidence. Yeah, narrow, narrow confidence mm -hmm. interval. So as far as the linguistic features that are used, and then in, the, in my dissertation, I think I have, let's see, about 70 or 80 uh, linguistic features and how they're used differently in these different contexts and comparing that to the real world. But yeah, um, at least with the register study, the confidence intervals are pretty tight. But... But I think your question is different, right? You're, you're saying, saying that, are these mechanics shared across uh, different games or is there so much variability across games? Was that your, well, that's how my, I understood my, my the question. question. My question was basically, if we can try to be predictive, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can say, well, these these 10 games share this game mechanic, right. Mm -hmm. okay. right. um, then are those confidence intervals like narrow? Like yeah. you would want them to be like for whatever outcome, outcome you're looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. Or are they like, well, they share this game mechanic, but yeah. 
It's a really mm. wild game. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then yeah. you, your answer was. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, we just, yeah, we do need more studies to kind of get a better idea so we can, you know, better aggregate and get those confidence intervals to be uh, tighter. But yeah, at least with my stuff, looking at linguistic features, not looking at language learning, really, they are, they are pretty tight. Um, so they do seem to be linguistically quite similar across different games. At across least, single player games. Uh, right. I was going to say yeah. target population. So. so if I were to target, let's say, racing games or something else like shooters. Multiplayer, MMOs. Yeah, those those might be different. Might be different. They use dialogue trees to some extent too, but yeah, it depends how you define, I guess, first the game, the mechanic, and that sort of thing. So there can be a lot of variability, especially since there's not a widely agreed upon definition of what a digital game even is, right? Uh, a lot of people have very interestingly strong opinions about what you should call a game and what you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's tough, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so since you just talked about how do you, how do you define, like uh, different people have different definitions of what a, what sure. a game is, what, if you don't mind me asking, <laughs> would you, how would you define a game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I do talk about that a bit in my uh, dissertation and just kind of draw on how people have defined them in different ways. I mean, to me, I, I really, it comes back to kind of the mechanics and like what's in it. For example, Duolingo, you can consider to be a game to some extent because, you know, it's got uh, leveling up in it, right? You gain these experience points, you get... Yeah, your avatar. avatar, you can get different clothes for them. Um, you get points. Points, there's yeah. competition. Yeah. So it has game-like features, but do you call that a digital game? Um, uh, we kind of did in our meta-analysis. We said, yeah, because they have these game mechanics, let's call it an educational mm -hmm. game because... But then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, for example, there are these Kahoot quizzes or quizzes. Right. Some people call those games as well digital games, so we did not include those in our meta-analysis because we wanted some games that had larger budgets maybe, uh, that were better tested and had maybe more of an equal ground uh, for them to be compared. So yeah, it's, it's a spectrum, I think. You can't say what a game is, but you can talk about Varying degrees of games. <laughs> um, or something. Yeah, it's it's a spectrum, definitely. <laughs> but I think what's really important, and it's good you asked that. I think it's really important that researchers do provide some sort of definition, which we do in the language learning technology article. We talk about okay, this is what we're considering a game. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times in the in the published research, they don't. So it's like, you know, what what are we, you know. Is this a game? Will everybody consider it a game? It's okay if people have different opinions, but as long as you're clear and saying this is what I think, this is what I'm calling a game for the purposes of this study, and here's why, I think it's totally fine as long as you have that, then people will know what yeah. you're trying to generalize to, right? <laughs> I just have a, have a quick follow-up comment. Sure. I'm currently working on a late reveal project and specifically looking at whether or not and how researchers define um, a game, or mm -hmm. whether they provide mm -hmm. their expl explanation of how okay. they use mm -hmm. a game in their study. Yeah. And it's quite interesting to see how many and, and how they define or not mm -hmm. define. Wow, so. yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I'd like to see yeah. that. It's great. Yeah, I mean, when we started doing the meta analysis, <laughs> at first it sounds like, oh, this is so structured, like I find the studies, I aggregate their effects. But then once you start reading the articles, you realize that, oh, wow, like I don't know what I'm looking at here. Is this a game or, you know, what kind of game did they use? That's why we double coded each article. And we also had another colleague on that article, all three of us. And we did a lot of discussion to make sure that, you know, what we included in the meta analysis uh, was clear. But yeah, I agree. Once you start looking at the literature, you see that there's just so much variation in terms of what a game is, yeah. And then, and then the, re the reviewers certainly had a lot of opinions too about yeah. <laughs> what should be included, why didn't you include this, why didn't you include that. But yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was a long process, of course, but um, yeah, it's really tough, and I'm glad you're doing that, yeah. that work, and I look forward to seeing mm -hmm. that, because that's been really, really hard. But there might, it, it might be barking up the wrong tree to try to pin down, like, for once and all, for once and for all, mm -hmm. what a game is, sure. right? Like, yeah. why, 
I, it's not an interesting conversation for me. Because it's like similar it's to saying, okay, task. Okay, all the TBLT researchers mm. can agree on like four things. Right. Yeah. But, you know, then there are all these different sub areas within task. Is it a totally. jigsaw task? And then with the jigsaw task, there's like many different ways to do a jigsaw task. Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's time well spent trying yeah. to chase down that question. Yeah, or tough. to just say, okay, it's game gameness on a scale. Sure. <laughs> or, or different types of. Game and, and yeah. I think we're there. You can say, here's this kind of game, here's right, this kind of game, single right. multiplayer. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe we should agree on some game mechanics. You know, it has to yeah. have these mechanics for it to be considered a digital game. Mm. But yeah, I don't think. We're getting there. Yeah. I think uh, it's just, yeah. <laughs> as long as you're describing exactly what you're trying to generalize to, I think that's going to be yeah. really the most important. Then you can call anything you want a game. And people can read, okay, that's what it is. Maybe I don't think it's a game, but I know what at least they're trying to generalize to. And that's probably the important thing rather than saying, no, this is a game and I'm the authority. Like, who gets to decide, anyways? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess my chime in. Sure. I think we don't define something for the sake of defining it. We define something for a purpose. For example, if it fits my particular research purpose, right. I'm looking for a particular kind of, say, commercial mm -hmm. game, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would say Blanche, uh, well, actually, I, I think I did a brown bag launch talk on what is a video game. I mean, share that article oh, nice. with you. But basically, um, I think, like, why are you trying to define what is video game? Or what is game? So, like, what's the purpose? I would ask that. Talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, would, I, I think it's really interesting to see, yeah, the different ways that people will have defined, uh, defined games, so that could be interesting. But I guess in my dissertation I talk about it, that a lot of the games in my targeted population draw on many well-established game mechanics that were made popular from Dungeons and Dragons, right? The old tabletop game that people still play today, leveling up, experience mm -hmm. points, player character, non-player character, like all that stuff came from uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So I think that's something like putting that in there, people could say, oh, okay, now I know what types of games you're trying to generalize to. So it's, yeah, about being really specific there. Mm -hmm. Are we about out of yeah. time here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all again. We really yeah. appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. And <laughs>